Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for our Global Value Chains Policy Talk. I am really excited to be hosting the talk today because our speaker is Kaimu Yi, who is the Senior Vice President in the Research Department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. He's on leave currently from the University of Houston, where he's the MD Anderson Professor of Economics. He's also a research associate with the International Trade and Investment and the International Finance and Macroeconomics Programs at the NBER. In the past, he's held positions with the Federal Reserve Banks of New York, Philadelphia, and Minneapolis after beginning his career as an assistant professor at Rice University. Appropriately for today, much of his past research has been on the causes and consequences of global value chains, talking about vertical specialization and multi-stage production and international trade. His research has been published in the Journal of International Economics, the Journal of Monetary Economics, the American Economic Journal of Macroeconomics, the Journal of Political Economy, and the American Economic Review. His current research is on firm and industry level structural change in an open economy and the implications of global value chains for international trade, growth, and inequality. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago, and we're extremely honored and delighted to have him here today. Uh, with no further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Professor Yi for about 20 to 30 minutes of uh, presentation, and then I uh, will open it up to your questions. If you have questions for the speaker, uh, please put them in the chat, and uh, we'll moderate those and also hopefully have uh, a discussion. So with no further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Yi. Thank you, Raymond, for those uh, very nice words. Um, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk here today. Um, I should say that uh, the views expressed here are my own, <coughs> excuse me, and not those of the Dallas Federal Reserve or the Federal Reserve System. So uh, I, I'm going to talk for a little more than 20 or 30 minutes. It's going to be more like 30 to 40, um, but they're really two parts. Here's the motivation and outline. In the first part, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about uh, uh, how I've thought about global value chains in my past uh, research, and you'll see that the kind of the concept that I have is a little bit more narrow than what you may be used to in what you've read in the media or in, in books or, or papers. And then I'll talk about how the global value chains can enhance and complement the process of growth and development. And then I'll turn to some data on measuring the extent of uh, countries' participation in global value chains and how that's evolved over time. And when I show some of these trends, you'll see that uh, the growth of global value chain participation has slowed or even stopped over the past decade. And I'll throw out some hypotheses for why that's uh, happening. So that's kind of the first part of the talk, kind of centered or just around the idea of global value chains and some measurement of it at the national and global level. Then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to turn to four major economic shocks. Unfortunately, they're all negative shocks that uh, the global economies have experienced over the last uh, several years. And I'll talk about how um, thinking about global value chains can help us uh, ascertain the effects and the magnitudes of these uh, shocks. And so they're going to include the US-China tariff war, which is still going on, and then the pandemic, as well as the recovery from the pandemic. And a key feature of that recovery has been this surge in inflation, uh, especially in the United States, but actually all over the world. Uh, and then that of course is the central issue that the Federal Reserve is dealing with right now. And then most recently, of course, the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. So, um, so let me start into this, into the first part and uh, with the concept with sort of what I have in mind when I, uh, think about global value chains, and uh, and uh, you'll see in this slide I have this phrase vertical specialization, and um, uh, so a kind of a key idea here is that the production process occurs in a in a sequence of stages. Um, if any of you have been involved in production, especially manufacturing, that will seem very obvious to you. But um, economists, especially even international economists. Um, only recently have they specifically taken into account the sequential nature of production in their, in their research. So in this diagram, uh, country two is kind of the key country. Um, so the idea is that uh, 
in the production process that uh, a firm in this country is going to import some of the intermediate goods it uses, and uh, it's going to combine those imported intermediates with some domestic intermediates, and then with capital and labor, which is what we call value added, and then it's going to make a final good or maybe a more advanced intermediate good, and some of the intermediate good or final good will be sold domestically, but some of it will also be exported. So a key feature of global value chains, an essential feature, is that in this production process, some fraction of the intermediate goods are imported, and then some fraction of the output is exported, which means that some part of that good is crossing multiple national borders. So let me just say the same thing, but in words now. Um, so the good is produced in two or more sequential stages. So that's true for all goods. And then the second two bullets are where we kind of narrow the definition. Two or more countries provide value added in the production of the good. And then highlighted in blue here, at least one country must use imported inputs in its stage of production. And some of the resulting output must be exported. So again, it captures this idea that in the production process, some part of it is crossing multiple national borders. So that's the way that I've thought about global value chains uh, over time. And, and uh, what I want to turn to now is how they can contribute to uh, globalization and growth. And so I want to illustrate that with this example in this table here. And if you look at the left column, what I have in mind is this uh, production process that has three stages. So there's an upstream firm that makes stage one, and then it uh, sends it to this downstream firm one, which makes the next stage, and then downstream firm one sends it to downstream firm two, the, and that downstream firm two kind of does the final assembly, and then the good is shipped to a consumer. And in this example, all of these activities uh, occur in different countries. So each time there's this uh, shipment from one stage to the next, it's crossing a different border. And each time it crosses that border, in this example, there's a 10% tariff. So in this, uh, and then in this simple example, there's just a hundred, let's say dollars of value added at each stage. So just looking at that first row, the upstream firm, to keep it simple, they have no inputs. They just have a hundred dollars of value added and then they sell it at a hundred. But the first downstream firm, um, they pay 110 because of the 10% tariff. Then they add 100 value added, they sell it at 210. But the second downstream firm, because of the 10% tariff, they have to pay 231. They add 100 in value added. Uh, the, this is the final part, they sell it at 331, but then the consumer has to, in effect, pay the 10% tariff. So they pay 364. So that's what happens in this world of 10% tariffs. Uh, across the board, across all countries. Now, suppose we come to this uh, global trade agreement and this 10% tariff is eliminated. What happens, the cost uh, to the consumer falls to 300, just the sum of those three value adds. But that cost is 18% less than what they paid before, which is double the 10% tariff. You know, why is that? It's because the upstream firm's uh, part of the production and, and the downstream firm one's part of the production, that was hit by the tariff more than once because this good while it was in process is being hit by the tariff uh, multiple times. So the cost falls by 18%, you know, almost double the 10% tariff reduction. And because of that larger cost reduction, you're going to get a greater increase in trade uh, compared to a world that doesn't have global value chains. Um, and so importantly, uh, kind of a kind of a corollary to this is that uh, suppose you had a good that was made entirely in, say, the United States, but now these tariffs are reduced. Now um, these firms in the U.S. can think about sourcing different stages uh, abroad and uh, and in multiple countries. And so, uh, and that of course is a big part of the story of globalization over the last forty or fifty years. This sourcing of different stages in different countries and the effect that that has on international trade. And in addition to getting this kind of magnified effect on international trade, there's going to be benefits to kind of the bottom line, the standard of living, GDP per capita. And why does that happen? It really goes back to the old ideas from Adam Smith that uh, the, uh, the importance of specialization, 
And when you can specialize, when a country can specialize in particular stages of a goods production sequence, rather than in the entire good itself, you know, it's like Adam Smith squared or Adam Smith cubed, the gains from specialization are even greater with commensurate effects on GDP and the standard of living. So that's kind of the concept of global value chains that I have in mind and how uh, GVCs in conjunction with global trade agreements, and I should say improvements in transportation technologies like containerization can lead to this enhanced effect on overall globalization as well as on standards of living. Now, let me turn to how we measure global value chains, especially at the aggregate level. I mean, you've probably heard of some of these granular anecdotes like how an iPhone is made, you know, with all these inputs that are produced in many countries, and then they're combined by Foxconn, this company in Shenzhen in China to make iPhones, and then a large fraction of those iPhones are exported throughout the world. But at the macro level, we're also interested in, in macroeconomic uh, numbers, national level numbers on the extent of these global value chains. And one of the main metrics is this concept called value added exports, which captures the domestic value added embodied in the country's exports. And it's usually expressed as a share of total exports. So it will typically be between zero and uh, one. And to the extent that this uh, metric is declining over time, that just means that the domestic value added, like US value added embodied in the dollar's worth of US exports is declining over time. The flip side of that is that the foreign value added embodied in the dollar's worth of exports is increasing over time. And so I'm going to call that an increase in global value chain participation. And you can see that just the nature of this metric, it ties nicely to that concept of global value chains I defined uh, earlier with this multiple border crossing. So how do we, what data do we use to calculate this? This relies on input output tables, which are these big data tables and matrices that organize industry by industry, uh, gross output, uh, final demand, uh, intermediate inputs and value added. And so these tables can tell you like how much output and value added are needed to produce like a $30,000 car purchased by a US consumer. And in particular, how much US value added versus international value added is needed to produce that uh, car. So that's how they're calculated. Now let me show some numbers. And this chart and the next two chart uh, give numbers drawing from this uh, paper by Johnson and Noguera. And uh, this uh, chart gives kind of at the global level, the change in this value added exports, again, the domestic value added embodied in a country's uh, exports uh, over time. This is like a weighted average across uh, this sample of 30 countries. And you can see uh, there's two takeaways here. Um, and so one of the lines includes uh, ROW, which stands for the rest of the world, and then the other line doesn't include it. But both lines you see are declining over time. Again, meaning that the domestic value added embodied in a country's exports is declining over time. And again, the flip side, the foreign value added is increasing uh, over time. So that's one of the main takeaways. And if you look at the dashed line, it's, it's almost like it uh, doubled. The uh, foreign value added embodied in a country's exports uh, almost doubled from roughly 17% to 30-something uh, percent uh, prior to the Great Recession. So that illustrates, you know, at this global level, the increased uh, global value chain participation over time. The other second takeaway is you see in the last year of that sample, which I actually think is 2009, um, in the middle of the Great Recession, that it increased. That as countries really pulled back on trade, especially imports, uh, during the Great Recession, the uh, domestic uh, value added kind of embodied in the in the the uh, exports that countries were making that uh, increased. So this uh, illustrates at a global level, uh, the increase in global value chain participation over time. The next slide shows that individual countries, uh, these three letter codes for the countries are on the X axis. And then the Y axis is the change in, in decimal points in the, uh, uh, in the value added uh, exports measure uh, between 1970 and 2008. 
And here there are two takeaways uh, again. Uh, the first is, um, you know, this general decline in all the countries in domestic value added invited in exports and countries like Thailand and Hungary, which have been big places for where um, companies from uh, Japan and Germany respectively have kind of sourced uh, production. You know, uh, countries like Thailand and Hungary have seen large declines in the domestic value added embodied in their exports. In other words, they're increasingly relying on imported inputs to for their exports. The United States, by the way, is in the middle of this uh, chart. And uh, so, so one of the takeaways is just this general decline in this uh, VAX, or in other words, increased global value chain participation. And then the other takeaway is there is a fair amount of heterogeneity across countries and highlighted by Norway at the far right, uh, what happened in Norway and to also in, to some extent in Great Britain and Australia is, is just this uh, uh, Norway and uh, Great Britain had these big oil and natural gas discoveries uh, during this period. And, and those are commodities with high uh, domestic value added invited in exports. And so that's why Norway is an outlier here. Now, this, the data on this chart and the previous chart only run until the Great uh, Recession, uh, you know, what's been happening in more recent years. So that's what this chart uh, shows, just focusing on the four major economies uh, in the world, the U.S., China, Germany, and Japan. And uh, the um, going from 1995 until 2018, so that's more recent. And then the y-axis, uh, now I show these shares in percent uh, form. Um, and here there are also two takeaways. Uh, the first is that prior to the Great Recession, so from 1995 to 2008, you see in all these uh, countries, the domestic value added by the exports declined. So they increased their global value chain participation. And then you have this Great Recession hitting where they all pulled back on that. And then since then, with the exception of Japan, uh, uh, it's either been flat or it's gone in the other direction. You know, in the U.S. and China, um, uh, the domestic value added embodied in exports has actually increased. And this was even before the U.S.-China uh, tariff war. So there's definitely been this leveling off in global value chain uh, participation and in some cases a decrease in global value chain uh, participation. So uh, it, over the past decade. And so that raises the question of why is this happening? Um, and, and the short answer is we don't know. Uh, we're still doing research on this, um, but there are several hypotheses out there. And here I'm gonna highlight three of them. So the first is that since uh, over the past uh, 15 to 25 years, we really haven't had major global trade agreements. The last one was uh, something called the Uruguay Round in 1994. That was the last uh, global trade agreement, and they've tried to have one since then, uh, but it's been very difficult and, and nothing uh, has transpired over the past quarter century. And then in addition, um, there really haven't been major improvements like paradigm shifting improvements in international transportation technologies, like containerization, which was first introduced in the 60s, and then over the next 25 to 30 years kind of spread to all the other countries in the world from the United States. And then even jet travel introduced in the 60s, and uh, that's pretty much spread around uh, the world now. Um, a lot of iPhones, for example, are shipped by air. You know, there are, of course, refinements in containerization and jet travel, but nothing paradigm shifting like the introduction of these. So, so with no major reductions in the cost of international trade, you're not going to get as much globalization or global value chain participation. So that's one reason. The second reason has to do with uh, what's been going on in China the past 20 years. Uh, and that's important because China um, is the world's largest trading nation now, and they become richer, they're more productive, the economy is larger, uh, wages are higher. So what does all of that mean? It means, well, my metaphor for China, let me just say the metaphor first and then get into it in a little more detail, is they used, to, in terms of global value chain participation, they used to be more like South Korea, and they're increasingly becoming more like the United States, just because their economic mass is just a lot larger now. And uh, as I mentioned before, they're now the second largest economy in the, in the world. And so 
a lot of those inputs that they used to import, uh, they don't do that anymore. They make them in China. And then now, because their economy is so large, their domestic market is very large, so they don't need to export as much as they uh, used to. In fact, uh, their export share of output has been declining for uh, the last 15 years, even before the Great Recession, uh, this uh, decline uh, started. So, um, and then related the uh, higher wages in China, it just means it's uh, less attractive uh, in terms of sourcing or production, um, especially labor intensive production. And so now uh, other countries like Vietnam are increasingly becoming destinations for that type of uh, sourcing. So this is another reason why global value chain participation uh, has declined. And then a final reason, um, a final hypothesis has to do with these long run trends in countries as they develop. And uh, you're probably familiar with this as countries develop the share of employment and value added in agriculture that just declines a lot. And then the share of employment and services increases and then in manufacturing and industry, it tends to follow a hump pattern, increasing and then decreasing. Um, and, uh, but if you kind of add it all up across all the countries, uh, basically the global economy now is more services oriented uh, than it was say 20 or 30 years ago. And in general, services are traded less than goods. So as more and more of the world's economies are involved in activities that are traded less, then you're going to have less uh, global value chain participation. With the caveat that it is harder to measure these things uh, with services, and I can talk about that uh, later. So, um, so these are three hypotheses that are out there. I think they all make sense, but what we don't have are hard numbers like X percent of the flattening of global value chain participation is due to this reason or that reason. We're, we're not there yet. Okay, so that uh, kind of concludes the first part of the talk. And let me shift uh, uh, to the second part where I just want to, as briefly as possible, go through these four major economic shocks we've had over the past uh, several years and then talk about how uh, uh, how global value chains can help us think about the effects of these shocks. So the first is the U.S.-China tariff war, um, which uh, really happened in 2018 and 2019. Um, it started with the U.S. imposing tariffs, a sequence of tariffs, but ultimately uh, $350 billion uh, worth of imports from China. This represents about two-thirds or 70% or of our imports from China at that time. And then China retaliated by uh, imposing tariffs on 100 billion of our exports to, to China. And that represented about two thirds of our exports uh, to uh, China. And these tariff increases weren't uh, small. Um, so US tariffs, our tariffs on goods from China went from up from 4% to 26%. And then their tariffs on our goods went up from 8% to 21%. And because these were the two largest economies in the world, even though it was largely this bilateral tariff war, they represented the largest increase in global tariffs since the Great Depression. Now, they made an agreement, the U.S. and China, to not increase tariffs further um, from January of two years ago, but the existing tariffs are still uh, in place and they're still exerting their effects. And so uh, because this has happened, uh, you know, three or four years ago, there have been a number of studies uh, looking at them. And uh, I'm going to uh, call one bottom up studies that uh, that look start from the disaggregated data and try to compute the costs and benefits of them, of these higher tariffs. And then they add them all up across all these individual goods. And then there are these top down model simulation studies that start with a theoretical model of trade. Um, and, and then put in some numbers and then uh, simulate the effects of like these higher uh, tariffs. And these are necessarily more aggregated than the bottom-up studies, but they do allow for feedback effects uh, from one sector to another, and then ultimately to wages and interest rates, uh, uh, et cetera. So what are the findings of these studies? Um, as usual, there's a range of numbers that come out of these studies. Uh, a couple of takeaways are that the losses to China are larger than to the US. And, and that's just because the, the, you know, we're imposing tariffs on kind of a larger share of, of their economy than their tariffs on our stuff. Um, you, you do see a big range of numbers though, like 0.1% of GDP to 1% of GDP. 
Uh, I just want to talk briefly about how you get that kind of number. Um, so let's start with our tariffs on China. It was on the $350 billion of imports, as I mentioned before. That's roughly 2% of U.S. GDP. But the losses to the U.S. Um, should be smaller than that. And that's partly, that's for three reasons. First of all, the tariffs, even though I mentioned they rose a fair amount, like by 20 percentage points, they didn't eliminate imports. So we're still importing a lot of goods from China. And to the extent we do that, in some sense, we're not experiencing a, a loss um, because we're still enjoying the value of those goods. Um, but the tariffs do reduce our imports from China and they have gone down. But to the extent there are substitutes for those imports, like domestic production in the U.S. or maybe imports from other countries, even if the substitutes are higher cost, to the extent we're able to buy those substitutes, that also mitigates the losses. And then finally, we're getting tariff revenue from these tariffs. And uh, all else equal, that's sort of like getting a tax cut. And so there's a benefit, uh, an offsetting benefit there. And so that's why the loss uh, to the U.S. is, is smaller than 2% of GDP. Uh, the, the, the share of imports where the tariffs are applied. But one uh, one thing I want to mention is even though those numbers seem small, you know, it's important to remember that in a normal year, U.S. inflation adjusted GDP grows about actually a little less than 2% a year. So if the losses are like 1% of GDP, you know, that's going, a, that's a big dent in, in getting us towards a, a recession. So it's important to keep that in mind. Now, I haven't talked about global value chains specifically, and part of it is because most of these studies actually don't explicitly take into account the sequential production I mentioned earlier. Um, if they did, uh, the calculations of these costs would likely be higher. Um, we would just think of that example that I gave earlier with the $100 of value added in each of those three steps. Think of that going in reverse. Um, you know, the, the costs would, would be higher than what these studies are computing, but likely they would be less than twice as high. So I think that's one way of framing these uh, results. So let me turn now to the dominant uh, global economic uh, thing or the dominant uh, global event of the last two years, which is the pandemic. And um, uh, starting with the uh, uh, the, the beginning of the pandemic, where uh, global trade declined by 14% in just one quarter between the first and second quarter of 2020, and at an annualized rate, it was close to 50%. And then, of course, a uh, big reason for this decline was all the COVID-induced uh, lockdowns and, and disruptions in supply, and these have spillover effects to the extent uh, all this supply is part of a global value chain. And so that's led to rethinking of the value of having global value chains. A lot of companies are thinking about reshoring production. In addition, uh, there's a lot of granular evidence that companies are abandoning this kind of just-in-time approach to, to production or lean inventories, and they're moving to building inventories. Um, in fact, a big reason why U.S. Uh, GDP growth was so high last year is because a lot of uh, there was a lot of inventory buildup. Um, but I'm just, in relation to all this uh, thinking that's out there, I'm just going to give one comment, um, and, and that's the following, that if the lesson from COVID is that our sense of the tail risks are larger, and either because we now recognize there's a higher probability of these so-called low probability events, and or our sense of the costs associated with these low probability events is now higher than before. So bottom line, the tail risk costs are much higher than what we thought they were. Then, in other words, we live in a, in a world of increased risk or uncertainty, then the right response to that is to diversify our supply chains, not to reduce them. So maybe we had a supply chain involving China. The solution is not to just reshore back to the US. The solution would be to keep the chain in China, but also have a chain in the US and maybe one with Mexico, uh, et cetera. So, um, so that's just a comment on, on some of this uh, thinking about uh, what to do uh, if our sense of tail risks is higher than before. Now let me turn to the recovery from um, COVID, and uh, this has been ongoing uh, for the last uh, close to two years. Um, and now, 
it hasn't all been smooth sailing, of course. Uh, there have been a lot of supply chain disruptions kind of of a different kind now, mainly on the demand side. And, and of course, there's been a lot of uh, inflation. Uh, have, it's happening globally, but especially in the United States. Obviously, this is something the Federal Reserve uh, and other central banks are uh, prioritizing. So I want to start uh, in, in terms of um, talking about this by just uh, uh, level setting in the sense that uh, a key feature of the global economic recovery has been this big increase in aggregate demand. And a large part of that increase is through fiscal stimulus. And so as an example, in the United States, we had a $5 trillion stimulus, which is close to 25% of US GDP. And to put that in perspective, that's like five times larger than what we did, uh, what the US did as uh, fiscal stimulus in the Great Recession. So that's just, and a large part of the stimulus was direct transfers to firms and households. So that's going to um, just create a big surge in aggregate demand. And, and the rest of the world did similar, similar uh, stimulus, um, although not as large as in the US. And so that's going to cause a rebound in investment and consumption demand. And then in addition, um, partly because of the nature of the responses to pandemics, to the pandemic with all of the uh, lockdowns and with the reduction in travel and eating at restaurants, people uh, in general were more homebound uh, than before. You know, there was this shift in demand from services to uh, goods, especially durable goods. You know, and one of the metaphors of this is like automobiles and those Peloton bicycles. And uh, this picture at the bottom of the slide uh, shows uh, U.S. household consumption spending. That's the blue line. And then it breaks it out into two of the subcomponents, uh, services and consumer durables. And this, uh, this all these lines are indexed to um, 2019 Q4. They're just set equal to 100 in that uh, quarter. So what you're really seeing is kind of the cumulative growth uh, since 2019 Q4. And you can see um, this gap uh, that opened up uh, with uh, between durables and services spending. I mean, both recovered, but uh, durables spending recovered much more rapidly. And even now is is 20% higher than in 2019 Q4, whereas services spending is still slightly below what it was uh, uh, in Q4. And the thing about durable goods is they're these uh, obviously physical goods and they're going to be a part of the global supply chains, the global value chains. And uh, and this has put a lot of stress on ports and factories. And you may have seen the uh, pictures or the photos of all these container ships just sort of hanging out in the Pacific Ocean uh, by Long Beach, Los Angeles, which are the two biggest container ports in the US for days and even weeks. Uh, one point I want to make is that uh, those container ports actually handled 10% more cargo uh, last year than they did in 2020 or in 2019. So they did handle a lot more throughput. It's just that the demand for goods uh, rose by even more. So basically this demand shock coupled with the, the surge in demand coupled with this uh, shift in the composition of demand towards goods, which then feeds into the supply chains, that's a big reason why we've had these disruptions and also inflation. Um, and so to highlight that inflation point even more, uh, this is a chart, it may be hard to read, so I'll just talk you through it. There are two panels. The left one corresponds to the Euro area, the right one to the United States, and the red line in each of them is core inflation. So that's inflation, total inflation or headline inflation, but with food and energy stripped out. And the reason uh, economists like to do that is because food and energy inflation tends to be volatile and importantly transitory. So that core inflation is actually a better predictor of future headline inflation than headline inflation itself. But in any event, you see that for both the Euro area and the United States, you see this path of the red line that um, uh, that they increased, it increased a fair amount, core inflation did in, in 2021. And then the blue bars uh, signify the contribution to the increase in inflation, to the inflation rate, contributed by goods that had supply disruptions. And you can see that, especially for the United States, uh, you know, these blue bars just became a lot bigger in 2021. And 
almost half the increase in core inflation in the US was because of supply disruptions. The Euro area had some of that, but not as much as in the US. Um, so then it's not surprising that uh, the US uh, had the biggest increase in inflation. Um, all the countries of the world had increases in inflation, but the US had the biggest uh, increase. And going back to the previous slide, I would attribute uh, at least some of that to the fact that we had the sharpest shift in this demand from services to goods uh, compared to other parts of the world. Now, let me uh, conclude with the, uh, uh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and obviously that's a major uh, humanitarian tragedy. Um, um, and, and then the economies of Ukraine and Russia, I mean, the Ukraine economy is totally devastated, and then the Russian economy is going to take a huge hit because of all the sanctions. Um, and then what I want to talk about is the spillovers to the rest of the world. And uh, they're going to operate through some major commodities, oil and gas, and then agricultural commodities like wheat and corn. And that's because Russia in particular, and also Ukraine are major producers of these commodities. So Russia is one of the big three producers of oil with Saudi Arabia and the United States. They have an 8% share of global oil production. And importantly, they supply um, a fifth of the Euro area's imports of oil and more than a third of their imports of natural gas. So the Euro area is especially reliant on Russian oil and gas. And then in terms of uh, wheat and corn, uh, Russia and Ukraine are big players and together they uh, account for a quarter of the world's uh, wheat supply. Um, the Ukraine, for example, accounts for almost all of Egypt's uh, wheat uh, imports. Now, because of the war and the sanctions, um, the prices of all these commodities have risen um, rapidly just in the past month. And uh, these commodities at the beginning of kind of a global value chain in involving these uh, commodities as inputs. And so the first level of downstream activities would be like the petrochemicals industry or food manufacturing. And these effects on those industries are going to be pretty large because these commodities are super important in their uh, production process as, as inputs. Um, but even when you go further downstream, you know, there are going to be continued uh, ripple effects operating through mainly through the higher prices. Um, and then in terms of thinking about the ultimate impacts, um, I think it's important to think of two, uh, two features about uh, the global value chains. So the first is that the global value chains link upstream and downstream production closely, you know, across countries, they're more complementary. So to the extent that the US and Mexico economies, for example, are more linked by global value chains than they used to be, you know, then when one country takes a hit, the other country will uh, take a hit uh, too, especially in the sense of uh, when the US economy takes a hit, then Mexico will take a hit and, and, and even more so, more in a more synchronized way than uh, before. And the simplest metaphor I have is like four tires are needed on a car. So if tire production goes from 200 tires to 100 tires, then you're going to go from 50 cars to 25 cars, just like that. So that's kind of one feature of global value chains I wanted to highlight, this complementarity of production across countries. Global value chains increases that complementarity. But then the ultimate effects are heavily determined by the availability of what I'll call upstream substitutes. So, you know, if Mexico was the only producer of tires or if Russia was the only producer of oil and natural gas, in the world, then the downstream hit would be massive. Um, but to the extent there are substitutes, you know, then that's going to mitigate uh, the uh, effects. And so in all of the calculations that have been done so far on the spillover effects of the conflict on the rest of the economy, those calculations take into account those uh, two effects. The complementarity on the one hand of this global value chain you know, the fact that oil and natural gas and then wheat and corn are absolutely essential for downstream production. But then on the other hand, to the extent there are substitutes, uh, you know, then the effects are mitigated. And in the case of the Euro area in particular, um, oil, there are some reasonable substitutes. Um, 
you know, some of you are probably familiar that uh, with the, the the fact that not all oil is the same. West Texas Intermediate is a little different from the shale oil, which is different from the UK oil, which is different from Russian oil. Um, but at the end of the day, depending on the refinery, they can all kind of be refined into like gasoline. And to that extent, uh, they are substitutable. Natural gas is uh, much different. It's much harder to find uh, substitutes, especially um, transporting it. And, and that's where the hit to uh, Europe and especially Germany uh, could be uh, large. So on this final slide, I've just given some of the magnitudes on the hits to GDP. And, and to the extent there's variation in these magnitudes, a lot of it is based on how, uh, how easily uh, the economists or the assessments by these economists view uh, the, the availability of substitutes uh, for natural gas. So why don't I stop here? I've uh, gone on, I think, for 40 minutes. And uh, just to you know, wrap up, uh, global value chains have been a key feature of globalization over the past three decades. And uh, they, they can kind of have two main impacts in the macro economy. One is this long run impact to the extent they uh, assist and enhance specialization. That's going to uh, have commensurate effects on GDP growth and standards of living. But on the other side at like business cycle frequencies, um, they're going to magnify the effects of shocks both positively and negatively. And I think uh, they help in our understanding of the major economic shocks we've had over the past few years. And then to go back to that slide I showed earlier, the global value chain participation has slowed over the past decade. So even before all these uh, negative shocks we've had. And so uh, we're still trying to figure out why. And uh, that has obviously implications for where it's headed going forward. Okay, so thanks a lot. And now I'm happy to take your uh, questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yi. That was really outstanding. And I think you touched on a lot of issues that are very close to uh, people's thoughts and concerns. We already had one question in the chat that uh, directly addresses subsidies and non-tariff barriers. And we, are you able to elaborate at all on how uh, subsidies and non-tariff barriers might affect our calculation uh, of uh, the effects of GVCs and particularly the effects of trade agreements? Thanks a lot uh, for the question. It's a great question. In that example, I just used tariffs. Um, you can think of subsidies as negative tariffs. And um, so the effects would kind of operate in a similar way. Um, so let me give a kind of an extreme uh, a hypothetical example. Suppose every country gave a 10% subsidy uh, to firms as long as they were exporting. So it was really like a subsidy for exporting. That would be essentially equivalent to like a tariff reduction and uh, global value chains would sort of enhance the propagation of those uh, subsidies and enhance the effects of it. And, and you would get a bigger increase in trade than you would uh, in a world without uh, global value chains. Um, but, it, but they do hinge on, uh, and then that's why I mentioned uh, the importance of global trade agreements. They hinge on um, kind of all these subsidies uh, or the reverse, like reductions in tariffs uh, happening in as broad uh, an environment as possible, like, like glo globally. Um, NTBs, uh, non-tariff barriers, uh, you know, they operate in a similar way. Um, so, uh, so one form of non-tariff barriers is, for example, in this latest uh, MCA agreement, uh, the kind of uh, NAFTA II, if you will, um, uh, one form of that was that uh, was this labor agreement that uh, a certain fraction of the value of uh, cars that are made in the NAFTA region, in the MCA region, has to involve labor that's paid more than $16 an hour. So that's essentially a way of ensuring that a lot of the value added of uh, automobiles is made in Canada or the US and not just in uh, Mexico. So that is a form of an NTB. And um, to the extent that uh, NTBs decline, uh, you know, you're going to get kind of the same effects like more global value chain participation. Um, uh, I should say, though, parenthetically, that there may be a good reason for some of these NTBs. Some of them like, are environmentally related as well. And so 
you know, in thinking of the overall effects or benefits and costs of them, you have to take into account those other factors. Great. Um, just for other folks who are uh, in the audience, if you have other questions, you might want to throw them in the chat. I'm going to take advantage of this moment um, to ask a quick question. Uh, yeah, if you could put those questions in the chat, that'd be probably easier. Um, but one of the one of the things that you've mentioned in your presentation was really kind of a seismic shift in the growth of trade over the last decade as compared to the previous several decades, right? And you put up several hypotheses. I'm wondering, uh, there's been a couple of other hypotheses which have come up, and I'm wondering if you might want to comment on those. Number one is that there's been uh, sort of a rise in, in trade pessimism, right? That people really did not feel that the gains from trade were what they were expecting, especially in developing countries. And this might have led to less enthusiasm in terms of policy and also in terms of engagement. That might be one. Another potential explanation is one that uh, Danny Roderick had raised you know, in 2018 about a, uh, just the idea that the proliferation of these trade agreements, the regional and bilateral trade agreements became increasingly complex and the complexity of these agreements actually might have tied down uh, some of the global value chains, right? Because the regulations were very specific or there might be, we were mentioning rules of origin earlier. So do you have a sense of kind of these other hypotheses and how they're, they're being evaluated? Thanks, Raymond. That's a great uh, question. And um, I think both of those uh, hypotheses have merit. Um, I, I'll still uh, I'll still put that under the rubric of no major trade agreements. Um, but but you're right. Uh, less it is true that uh, emerging market economies. Uh, I mean, many of you have heard of this uh, thing called the Washington Consensus, which was really dominant in the 1990s. This thing that if emerging market economies wanted to grow rapidly and, and move into advanced economy status, you know, there was a certain kind of formula they needed to follow. They needed to reduce their barriers to the rest of the world. They needed to, to open up their international capital flows, you know, just move more to this free trading world, both in terms of goods and services and also international uh, financial capital. Um, and, and that was the prescription that these uh, institutions like the, uh, the, the World Bank and the IMF gave. And of course, the United States policymakers were giving that prescription. But yeah, certainly in the past uh, decade and a half, uh, I, I think emerging markets have uh, soured on that uh, somewhat. And so, yeah, they're a little less eager to follow that uh, advice. And then even the advice itself has changed, especially regarding international uh, capital flows. And so, uh, um, so, so maybe it was oversold, maybe as a panacea, um, and uh, there are always winners and losers in these trade agreements. I mean, we, you know, we, we, uh, there's hard evidence that there's an aggregate gain overall, but there are definitely losers and uh, uh, firms and households that lose. And if um, they have a loud enough voice, that can, you know, have a, have a, you know, a, an effect on this uh, glo globalization. In terms of the regional and bilateral agreements, uh, you know, in some sense, I feel that is a, a, uh, a symptom of the fact that uh, the world's economies have not been able to come together to do a global agreement. And so now you have these different groups forming their own agreements. And it is true that that may not help global trade because you have these subset of countries that make a free trade zone, zone within themselves, but then they impose higher barriers with the rest of the world that may not necessarily uh, help uh, global trade, you know, as you said, as we were talking about earlier and related to your own uh, research. Um, so I, I don't know what the, so I think both are, are valid. Yeah, thank you. Well, now we have a couple more questions uh, coming in. I'd like to share those with you. One is from our um, very esteemed co-director of our Global Value Chains program here at the Bush School, Leftir Zayakavu, who wants to know what you see uh, as the impact of the new trade-offs that companies and nations are exploring on supply chain resilience on the one hand and versus cost efficiencies. You mentioned bringing production back to the United States, but obviously there's a big cost component to that. 
It might be more resilient, but there might be some cost trade-offs. And uh, if you've thought about uh, national security issues as well, right? Because that's also been part of that discussion is, is whether or not we'd be promoting national security through the reshoring. Do you have comments on that? Sure, thank you for the question. Um, on the first part, that is the essential, uh, you characterize the essential trade-off, this fact that it may not be as cost efficient because, you know, maybe before there was a cheapest uh, supplier, a most inexpensive supplier, and that's the one you relied on exclusively. But now, uh, because of this uh, recognition that uh, the risks and uncertainties may be larger than what we thought, uh, you know, there's a greater importance on resiliency and flexibility in the event of these that these risks and uncertainties materialize. And so I think all firms now are going through that calculation. And, um, um, you know, the, the fundamental part of that cost benefit thing is, you know, by having resiliency, you're not gonna do the cheapest stuff. So that means for most times, you're gonna probably have less profits than before, but then for the 1% or 5% of the times where there's this major disruption, you know, your loss in profits will be much smaller than before. And so you just have to weigh those two in the in the calculation. And I, I believe, you know, that I think that's what firms are doing right now. And in terms of national security, you know, I think uh, what comes part and parcel with this recognition that the risks and uncertainties, especially on the tail risk side, are bigger than before, is uh, a corollary, is a recognition that more goods might need to be put into this uh, national security uh, realm than before. Um, you do want to be careful not to put too many there because, you know, pretty you're on your way to uh, autarky the more you do that, right? So uh, there definitely has to be some cutoff or some boundary in terms of uh, the, the goods and especially the upstream inputs that are in this national security category, but it's but it's definitely a rational response to what's been happening with the COVID uh, to, to seriously consider putting more uh, goods or inputs into that category. So the, the next question that came in, I think is related to your role at the Dallas Fed. So you can handle this as you want. But the question is specifically, did the US government print more money to pay for the stimulus program that we had? And how much of today's inflation is due to the stimulus program specifically, in, in your own personal opinion, not speaking for the Fed, of course? Right, uh, right. So yes, my answer to both of those questions um, is uh, represents my own view. So let me start with the second one. Um, how much of the increase in inflation is related to the fiscal stimulus? And, um, you know, the, the short answer is I, I cannot give you a quantitative number, um, like 30% or 60%, um, but it does seem pretty clear it is a significant number and um, uh, related to the stimulus. And, uh, uh, and, and simply because, and it's really based on one correlation, and, and that's why it's something that you have to uh, interpret uh, with a grain of salt. And the main correlation is this fact I mentioned earlier that the U.S. had the largest fiscal stimulus of like all the advanced economies, and they've had the largest increase in uh, inflation. Um, so, um, but on the other hand, as I mentioned also, the U.S. had the largest shift in demand from services to goods. Mm -hmm. Too. So, so this is why it's hard to, at this point at least, to put a number on that. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'll say to this also is that, of course, this inflation is bad and, and everybody is uh, unhappy about it, but a corollary of the high inflation we have is this uh, recovery, this rapid recovery we've had where unemployment, you know, it rose to 14 or 15 percent, the highest since the Great Depression. And then in less, a little more than a year, it's gone back down to under 4%. So, so the stimulus played a big role in that too. So, you know, I think the question you want to, um, you want to think about is, would you have been willing to have less inflation, but also less GDP growth and less, uh, a, a smaller decline in unemployment? Um, in terms of the first uh, question, so, you know, as part of the um, 
so of course with the when the pandemic hit you know right at the beginning of the pandemic actually the decline in output and the increase in unemployment was actually much worse than the great recession the the rapidity of that decline was much worse than the great recession and even worse than uh almost all of the months of the uh, great depression um and, and so that led to these stimulus packages both on the fiscal side and the monetary side on the monetary side you know we were already uh, we had just started raising interest rates uh, but we hadn't gotten very far you know as a result of the recovery from uh, the great recession so we quickly lowered those rates to zero but you know then we encountered this uh, phenomenon called the zero lower bound you can't really make interest rates negative so that's what when we turn to this other tool that we have you know buying uh, assets especially treasuries and mortgage backed secur- government guaranteed mortgage backed securities which we used for the first time in the great recession so we kind of went back to that tool and uh, started buying uh, these treasuries and mortgage backed securities and one of the first principles of buying these types of bonds is that uh, when you buy them you raise the price and the flip side of that is you lower the interest rates so what our policy did was it lowered both the short term interest rate which is our usual tool and then we also lowered long term interest rates and this is one reason why the housing market unlike most uh, recessions the housing market really didn't see much of a recession in fact it's boomed uh, throughout the pandemic and the and the recovery so um so that's that's what we did we and and what we do is we just go by the existing stock of uh treasuries and mortgage mortgage backed securities or some fraction of that stock that we bought it uh altogether all about 4 trillion in those uh assets um and as it turns out uh, as the questioner said i mean the us government because of the fiscal stimulus um uh was issuing a lot of debt uh, you know there's only two ways to pay for that fiscal stimulus you raise taxes or you borrow and obviously raising taxes in the middle of a very bad recession was a non-starter and so the us government borrowed so in effect the us uh, the federal reserve did wind up buying a lot of these new assets but one point i want to make these newly issued like treasury debt but one point i want to make is even if there was no fiscal stimulus we still the federal reserve would have still bought uh, those uh, 4 or 5 trillion in assets and in fact they might have bought more even because uh, if there wasn't any fiscal stimulus then there would have been much more uh on the fed's play to do to engineer a recovery so the the fact in some sense that there was a fiscal stimulus actually allowed the fed to buy less than they would have otherwise and so this just comes back to the general point that congress uh, gave us this mandate to have stable uh, inflation which the fed has defined as 2% inflation and then also full employment or maximum employment and so everything that we do is toward meet, meeting that goal and uh, until this surge in inflation that we had in the past year the fed was actually missing on its goal from below we had inflation uh, consistently below 2% uh, uh until last year essentially or or a little more than a year ago so i, I hope that uh, helps we were not monetizing the debt in the way that uh, Zimbabwe was uh, uh recently or Israel in the 1990s or some of the South American countries Brazil and Argentina you know where there's sort of a direct connection between the treasury and the monetary authority um so we were not doing that um we were just doing our thing which was trying to have 2% inflation and and maximum employment but as part of doing that we bought a lot of these uh assets Great. Uh well I think we have time for one more question just to respect the time. Um and what do you think looking forward as we're coming out of the pandemic? What's your outlook for globalization? Are we expect to see more trade uh or would you expect to see a continuation of the trends over the last decade? Would you have some sense of uh what's your outlook? Yeah, that's really the um you know it used to be called the $64,000 question but now I think uh, because of inflation we have to call it a 64 billion dollar or even 64 trillion dollar question because the global economy is uh, getting close to a uh, 100 uh, trillion dollars it's on that order of magnitude um uh you know it's uh, it's it's just uh, hard hard to say um 
Um, I guess, uh, so again, this is totally uninformed, but you know, I, I can imagine a scenario where the trends of the past 10 years uh, just sort of continue, that there's sort of these offsetting forces, you know, that some globalization will resume, but some other forces uh, going against globalization, uh, you know, China just becoming a larger share of the world economy, that's going to continue. And then they're going to continue to, you know, rely less on the global economy simply because they're just bigger, um, like the United States. And, and then, of course, this structural change thing I mentioned, where the global economy is becoming more services oriented, that's going to continue. So I guess I can imagine a scenario where these numbers stay sort of flat. Uh -huh. Well, I definitely wanted to thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. I want to thank all of our participants. Please stay engaged with the Mossbacker Institute. We have many more uh, exciting events coming up. And uh, want to please join me in thanking uh, Professor Kaimui. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk with you. Thank you very much for joining us. We're very honored.